quick question. How many of you are connected to, know someone, or involved with someone who has Alzheimer's? Would you, would you stand up? Just stand up. Let us take a look at how many of us are touched by wow. this disease. It's more than you think. It's interesting when you realize, uh, go ahead and sit down, thank you. There are over 80 different kinds of dementia, and Alzheimer's is number one. But it's also about fear, <coughs> as, as you know. And I want to just, uh, there's no limit to my praise for John Wotring. He has studied this disease and the care, the, the heartfelt care of people for well over 20 years. And uh, my mom was in his care for a, a number of years. I'm so, so pleased to introduce John Wotring of Provo. Yeah. <laughs> Good morning, Section on Aging. It's been a while since I've been here, and boy, you guys have changed. You've grown lungs. What great singers. <laughs> Somebody at my table said, whoa, I hate to follow that. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> Certainly do. Um, I have a lot of material. It's a basically an eight-hour training that Chance said I have 40 minutes for, and Sheila said I have 20 minutes for. And so I whittled it down. I whittled it down. So some of the slides, if you need a copy of the slide presentation, I can email it to you when we're done. All right, this is my inspiration. That's Maxine. Do you know Maxine? Yeah. A really honorary grandmother who's very cynical. She represents my grandmother and my inspiration for being an Alzheimer's care. Like Chance's mom was there, so is my grandmother. And I've dedicated the last 20 years of my life to taking care of her and people like her. We have a nonprofit that gathers research. So what I bring you information today up here, it's based on studies. If you need copies of those studies, I'll let you know. What is dementia? Dementia is not Alzheimer's disease. Dementia is a group of symptoms. It literally Latin means you're out of your mind. If you have a problem with your memory and just your memory, do you have Alzheimer's? No. Maybe not. Are you demented? Uh -uh. If it's just memory loss, you have one cognitive loss. Who said to have MCI? When I was a kid, that was a phone company. <laughs> 10, 10, 2, 20. Stay 10, 10, 10. <laughs> we get a, um, a lot of medical conditions can resemble somebody having dementia, which is two or more primary losses. Okay? So let's say you have a problem with judgment and memory, then you're demented but there are some medical things that can mask that. Oftentimes we'll have people with urinary tract infection who will present very demented and they're really not quite there yet. Or they're dehydrated is a problem with yellow blood. Senile, do we know what senile means? Clinicians in the room? I've asked a lot of people that over the years. They said, oh, that means you're crazy. My grandmother on my mother's side was diagnosed as being old and senile. Senile is a benchmark of age. It means you're 65 years or older. <laughs> <laughs> How many people in this room are senile? I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not there yet, but I'm working on it. Because of its prevalency of memory loss, people liken senile to being old. It's not. Four leading causes of dementia. Now, there's tons of them out there, but these are the leading ones. Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, Lewy body dementia is up and coming, unfortunately. It's a really bad one associated with Parkinson's disease and vascular dementia. Those are the big ones, but Chance is absolutely right. Number one, most common, 78% of all causes of dementia out there Alzheimer's is number one with about 78%. It's a lot, it's a lot. Currently, 5.1 million people in the United States with Alzheimer's disease. That's just the US. It's a lot of confused people. By 2040, they say the number's gonna go to 14 million unless we have some sort of major intervention. This is the hardest thing for me to consider only one in four are diagnosed. 
one in four is not enough i don't know how many people will come to me and they have a diagnosis with a doctor writes on their dementia well yeah i know that we want to know why how can we help them symptoms always starts alzheimer's always starts with short term memory loss short term memory loss is where it starts it affects the hippocampus primarily first it's diagnosed in a whole bunch of different ways there's a lot of new diagnostics that are going out there. The easy way that most family care practitioners diagnose is they'll do a mini mental test. If you fail your recall section or your awareness section, they'll say, yeah, you have dementia, most likely it's Alzheimer's disease. 80% of the time, if they guessed, they'd be right. <laughs> Think about the odds. You don't get those odds in college. <laughs> so there's, unfortunately, less diagnosis goes on than is needed. Medications for Alzheimer's disease. Right now, the only medications that are commonly used treat the symptoms, but do not change the course of disease. You'll still die and go through a very difficult process. They may delay symptoms, but they don't change the course of the disease. But hopefully that will change soon. Typical Alzheimer's progresses through the brain, starts in the center where the hippocampus is and works its way and affects the entirety of the brain. You ever see a brain before? Touch it, poke it, squish it. Yeah. A soft grapefruit. This is a normal brain. This is a 65-year-old man from Duke University. I don't know where he lived before, but that's where he lives now. This is a normal brain. 65-year-old, same size head with Alzheimer's disease. See the shrinkage? Yeah. The brain is actually dying one cell at a time. The man's head didn't shrink. Just his brain and size. What did Dr. Alzheimer's see? If you look on the slide on the right, it has these beta amyloid chunks and neurofibrillary tangles. This slide I have to reference because it didn't go up here, but it's courtesy of the CDC. We have these billions of neurons in our brain and they get mucked up with this beta amyloid and neurofibrillary tangles, clumps. A lot of the research has been to find out what causes this buildup of beta amyloid, with the assumption that this beta amyloid causes Alzheimer's disease. But this is what Dr. Alzheimer's saw under his microscope. Costs. This is a big one. Alzheimer's cerebral cost providers $226 billion in 2015. More than halfway there. Taxpayers are currently paying 68%, which is all of us. It's Medicare dollars. 16 million families and friends provide 18 billion hours of unpaid care. That's astounding. Just astounding. American businesses also suffer 33.16 billion. That's last year's number. And that's really from caregivers who also have somebody at home with Alzheimer's disease taking off work to care for them. Okay, that's how the costs are real. The scary thing is by 2050, they're looking at a cost of $1.1 trillion. Think about how much money that is. I know our government counts money in trillions. I certainly don't. I don't even count it in millions or billions yet, but I'm working on it. <laughs> Risk factors, this is what you guys want to know. Age is number one, that's why senile is important, right? Over 65, one in nine. Over 75, one in five. Over 85, it's actually one in 0.47. It's one in two, basically, because you can't divide a person. But half of everybody over 85 of the population who has Alzheimer's now will have Alzheimer's, will, will be demented and have Alzheimer's disease. All right? Wow. How many people in here know at least two people over 85? Yeah. Statistics would say, you know, at least one of them has dementia or will. How many people know people over 65? Quite a bit. If you know 10 or more, one of them has Alzheimer's. The scariest thing I'm most concerned about, selfishly, because of my family, is when I get there. 
because the baby boomers don't have good odds. For baby boomers, the, the projections at this point is one in three will have dementia. How many baby boomers in the room? Raise your hand. <laughs> and sorry. <laughs> now, the good thing is there's a lot of research and there's a lot of hope. But the generation we're caring for now that has Alzheimer's disease and has dementia has very different lifestyle than all you baby boomers out there. You guys grew up with fast food. Yep. You guys perfected and the dishwasher and a, a lot of modern conveniences that gave you a very different and much easier lifestyle than the previous generation. You had more downtime, more free time, and you guys experimented with some quack medications in the 60s and 70s. <laughs> I guarantee your parents didn't sit there and drop acid, right? <laughs> it's a theory, but it is what? It is what? And one of the potential brain injuries that they're likely to be an increase in risk for Alzheimer's disease for the baby boomer generation. They don't know for sure. They know it's more prevalent. They're working on the why. So risk factors, APPO4, genetics. A lot, again, a lot of this was reviewed for you guys, so I'll make it quick. There's a gene called APPO3 and APPO4. APPO3 is good, APPO4 is bad. Bad because it increases your risk. A lot like cholesterol does for heart disease, APPO4 does for Alzheimer's disease. Now you go get a test for cholesterol, and you can take a statin drug, or you can exercise, or watch what you eat and make a difference. How big an increase in risk is it? Doesn't mean you're gonna get Alzheimer's disease if you have APO4 on one of your chromosomes, or even two of your chromosomes, but your chances go up. If you're female, and you have the APO4 genome marker on one chromosome, 400% increase in risk. Wow. That's a big increase. If you have it on both your chromosomes, you have a 1,200% increase in risk. Now of all the cases of Alzheimer's disease out there, less than 10% are familial, familial or genetic. It doesn't mean you're gonna have Alzheimer's, it just means your risk is higher. My family, my inspiration, my grandmother who had Alzheimer's disease, inspires me to wanna solve this one, and soon, before I get there. Diabetes. There's a relationship with diabetes and Alzheimer's disease. They know that people who crave sweets have a higher propensity to have Alzheimer's disease. It's because you're trying to compensate, so you have more sugar, so you get that, or is it causal? They don't know yet, but they know there's a relationship. But they do know that there's a causal relationship with diabetes and Alzheimer's disease. There's a cardiovascular incidence of stroke and lack of oxygen to the brain. So if anyone has drowned, your chances of getting Alzheimer's disease go up about 200%. You passed away. Or had a heart attack, or had a stroke. My grandfather had his first stroke at 78 years old. My aunt, who is the head of epidemiologist for the CDC, did his autopsy and found that his brain was also riddled with Alzheimer's disease. Had both. Brain injury. This is an interesting one. I think about the football players, I think about car accidents. Every time you see a car accident, woof, if anybody was knocked out for more than five minutes, your increase of Alzheimer's disease goes way up, 400%. Obesity. There's, there's a very fascinating study where a university measured people around their barrel as a predictor for Alzheimer's disease. And there is a correlation. The wow. larger you are, the higher your risk. But they had a range. So they took a lot of people that were in the risk zone, put them on a crash court diet, trained their bodies, but did not change their risk. Lifestyle and how it affects Alzheimer's disease isn't a crash thing. It's a long-term lifestyle. Okay? Kaiser observations. Some of these are published and some of them are not. But one of our consulting neurologists has access to a lot of Kaiser files. Thank you, Dr. Bernstein. <laughs> people on high fish oil diets had less Alzheimer's disease, less people using anti-inflammatory medications. And Advil a day will 
drastically reduce your risk of getting Alzheimer's, but you will for sure blow out your kidneys. Right. Okay. There is less also in the use of estrogen, but then again, if you're on estrogen, then your cancer risk goes way up. People who smoked had less Alzheimer's disease. In part, they didn't live as long. <laughs> If age is the biggest risk factor, that was certainly a part of it. Even age adjusted, nicotine somehow has a cell strengthening capability. They don't know exactly why. Right now, the University of Iowa is doing a study with all these college kids wearing a nicotine patch, trying to figure out why is it that nicotine somehow helps. Coffee, another stimulant, also helps. Okay, my caffeine boost. People with higher education had less Alzheimer's disease. What they really had, in my theory, is the Arnold Schwarzenegger principle. Everybody knows who Arnold Schwarzenegger is, right? Right. When I was in high school, he was a bodybuilder still, and he was Mr. Universe, and he had 30 inch biceps. Huge. My waist at the time was only 27 inches. Away. <laughs> Holy cow. If he lost half of his biceps, it was still larger than my arm. Wow, he had reserves, right? The theory with education is it also builds the cognitive reserves you need, okay? Use it or lose it. Hope <laughs> is what you guys really need to know. What I did is I compiled the four largest things coming out of research this year that would be interesting and how we can change this course. The Gladstone Institute works out of the basement in UCSF, and they're a privately funded research company. And I've been to several of their seminars and locations and talked to their physicians and brought them to Primrose, and what they have found is that if they change the shape of an amyloid precursor protein, what they call a tau, from APPO4 shape, which is bad, to APO3 shape, they can cure thousands and thousands and thousands of cases of Alzheimer's. <laughs> they can fix mice today. How long do they can fix us with that same theory? That is the right question. How long before they can fix us? Another Gladstone Institute scientist, her colleague, had a different approach. Gosh, let's eliminate tau. If tau is not splitting properly and causing Alzheimer's disease as a byproduct, that's beta amyloid gooey yucky stuff that we don't want to see. He said, well, let's wipe it out altogether. So he had these Alzheimer's engineered mice. He used a proprietary blend of medications to wipe out his tau, or, or her, I don't know if they're gender specific mice. And they performed just as well as mice that never had Alzheimer's, by the way. So two different ways of dealing with tau from the Gladstone Institute that could potentially be game-changing for Alzheimer's disease for the future. With earlier diagnostics and potential treatments there, that could be the future. Now it's gotta go through several stages of trial, all these treatments do, before anything really can be done for us. It won't help people who have it now, okay? They're not there yet. One of the most fascinating ones is way across the pond in Australia. This is a fascinating study. The Queensland Brain Institute uses sonic waves. MRI machines close, but they have sonic waves. But they use a sonogram machine to vibrate open the blood-brain barrier. Clinical nurses in here know that we have a a brain barrier that keeps the body's immune system from attacking itself. Some of you remember Elon Pharmaceuticals in 2004 developed an Alzheimer's vaccine. They shot 436 people with a piece of their Alzheimer's on the other side of their blood brain barrier and it wiped out the beta amyloid in their brain. So they're following those people now and doing their autopsies to confirm it. But the only way right now is 100% diagnosis. This does something similar. It opens up the blood-brain barrier, allows your own immune system to solve the problem of tau. No medication. So far, 
in their mind and their sheep, because as far as they've gotten as the sheep, their sheep are not confused. Their mice are not confused. And the unique thing about this particular one, of the mice and the sheep that they've tested it on so far, their mice and sheep have regained 75% of their functional memory. Think about that. Their brain wasn't dead, but not functioning. So they're able to restore some function, not all of it. The human trials are scheduled for 2017. That's extremely fast. It probably never happened in the United States for FDA, but it can happen in Australia. Cambridge University in England, they're doing a statin-like drug, and this has a molecule that basically binds to the beta amyloid to stop its effects. Uh, a statin-like drug. So we were talking earlier about cholesterol being a risk factor for heart attacks, right? And your genetics being a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. For your cholesterol, you would take a statin drug. For Alzheimer's, you might take this drug to help reduce your risk. It's not a panacea, it's not a cure, but it may be something that helps reduce your risk. UCF, Stanford University are doing a study right now with our local Dr. Bernstein and Eli Pharmaceutical Company, Eli Lilly. They're testing a formerly debunked treatment, I can never say this name, sonomazimabazin to <laughs> Doesn't sound like it's from around here. But they were hopefully gonna be a panacea type pill that would cure Alzheimer's disease. What they're finding is the people that were in the trials that got the medications that was debunked, it inhibited the development of beta amyloid. So now they're looking at it as a risk reducer. They're studying it again to reduce the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease, if not slow the progression. Now, these four agencies doing this are paramount because they're the first ones to really give us what I think is really good hope to change the course of the disease. UCSF and Stanford, there's a Stanford doctor who is doing tests with mice again by blocking a protein called EP2. Now if he give, gave it to mice that already have Alzheimer's disease, it reversed the effect. So they have a very confused mouse and then they, they, give them, they block this EP2 protein in their brains and they're able to produce and function as if they're normal mice. I hope we're better than mice. We'll see. So they gave these genetically engineered mice who did Alzheimer's disease, they gave them a, a substance, a medication, to block EP2, and they would not develop dementia again, ever. They're engineered to get it, but they won't. That is a tremendous amount of hope. The hope is that for the baby boomers who are vested to be one of the wealthiest of our generations ever, that they will pour the money into helping find the cure, helping get these potential treatments off to the trial phases, off to the human trial phases. I know we can cure mice. If you don't like medication and treatment, there is lifestyle that will help delay the onset of Alzheimer's disease. I played a lot of sports growing up, and we're all born, as my coach says, with a certain amount of um, well, coordination. I didn't have a lot. <laughs> but you can enhance your coordination with practice. We talked about the Arnold Schwarzenegger principle, and he talked about building that cognitive reserve. This is accumulation of research of how to do that. Alzheimer's Association funded a study that exercise at least 20 minutes a day, five days a week, but no more than 40 minutes at a time, five days a week, will help. Diet, high in folic acid, low with HGI is a high glycemic index, that's how fast foods turn to sugar. Avoid processed foods, saturated fats, you want to eat olive oil, high omega-3s, avoid cholesterol, high in antioxidants, 
especially pseudolycopene. Pseudolycopene is the thing in food that provides color. Makes your blueberries blue, your cyberries purple. Okay. They're really, really good for you because they fight against free radicals. Low sodium diet and fasting. This is a relatively new one, but they say eat all your meals within 13 hours. 13 hours. So if you start eating at 8 o'clock in the morning, that's the, let's say 6 o'clock in the morning, your last bite's at 7 o'clock at night. Right. For those midnight munchers, not good. What they say it does is fat builds up in your brain. By fasting, it allows your body to consume and use that fat in the brain. The fat in the brain somehow lends itself to misshaped proteins. And when your protein's misshaped, that's not good. That's what happens with fat. Socialize. Married couples live healthier lo and longer. Two or more friends socialize with at least weekly. Cognitive exercises. Now, I gotta, I gotta say something about the gym. Who likes to go to the gym? Nope. <laughs> Who would rather go for a walk outside with their dog and kayak and have fun? Yeah. <laughs> Me too. I hate sitting there doing the hamster in the gym. I feel like a hamster in a wheel. So whatever cognitive exercise you choose to do, you better enjoy it. I'll play racquetball for eight hours, but, but I don't want to lift weights or do the, the, the treadmill, no way. So as you look at this list, think about the things that you like to do that are challenging for your brain. The number one for women after 55 is learning a foreign language. Hard to do. Hard to do. It's not retaking French you took in high school either. Stress reduction, find your coping skills, meditation, exercise, music therapy, retail therapy. My mom loves this. <laughs> this is not buying things and the satisfaction you get or the buyer's remorse you get from buying something too big. The retail therapy, they found that actually going out shopping itself reduces stress. Not for me. <laughs> <laughs> retail therapy, again, Pick the stress relief that works best for you and get enough sleep. All right, this is back to Maxine. This is my grandma. I have a nickel for every time I misplace my car keys or else be a jar of money. I have to also look for it. <laughs> the one thing I would implore you guys to do is to fund research. And I want to take a moment and, and bring up Lauren to talk about the Alzheimer's Memory Watch just for a minute. She didn't know I was going to call her up here. <laughs> and her services. And her services. I think it's all medicine. Yes. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Lauren Hinton. I'm the Family Care Specialist at the Alzheimer's Association. And I know when you guys stood up, about half of you said that you have a connection to the disease, and those of you that don't, after listening to John's talk, it's pretty clear that we were either going to have Alzheimer's ourselves, care for someone, or pay for the care. So um, the biggest thing I think we can do, like John said, is to um, take money toward research. The one thing that stands in the way of research is money, and number two is people to participate in clinical trials. So we have a clinical trial matching program for folks with a diagnosis, a family connection, healthy caregivers, healthy individuals. Um, they will go out and do the legwork for you and find out what clinical trials are in the area. So if you're interested in clinical trials, that's one way to support. Um, and um, we, what we do at uh, the Alzheimer's Association um, is care and support. Uh, while we are looking for a cure, um, we are helping families and those with the diagnosis to um, deal with this journey. So we have many support groups. We do care planning um, and care consultation. And we have um, just a lot of services, not only for the family, but also for the person with the diagnosis. So uh, if you don't know that we exist, then um, take a rap card and do a little research on our website or Do we have any questions for John or Lauren? Yep. I have a couple. Hey, John. Um, I have two questions. One is how many types of dementia? Somebody said there were like over 70. Um, types? I would say causes. What are the things that can cause? 
cause dementia. I'd say there's a lot more than seven. There's probably hundreds of reasons why you could be out of your mind. When you, your judgment could be impaired. You could have psychosis. You could be clinically depressed. You could do all kinds of things that change your brain. Your brain is a bunch of big bag of chemicals. The chemicals are off. It's not going to work right. There's a lot of different causes. Okay. The other question is, um, somebody had mentioned that it's in your system like years before it begins. Is that true or not? Um, for Alzheimer's disease specifically, about 10 years ago, they said, well, gosh, we think it's forming in the brain. Your brain, brain is degrading at least four years before you notice any symptoms. Now they're saying it's more like 15 years before you notice you have any symptoms, which is why funding the Alzheimer's Association for research is so important because we really need early diagnosis. We really need early diagnosis. Good question. Uh, I have a friend who died of leukemia two weeks of the body bone prep, mm -hmm. and I love your early promoting of this. And you said it's on the increase. It is. And it was, she was, yeah, she wasn't over 70. I know that for sure. Lewy body dementia tends to have an earlier onset than Alzheimer's disease. It's, they believe it to be associated with Parkinson's disease. Where symptomology, we think of Alzheimer's disease, the first thing you think of is memory loss, right? Where's my jar of money? Where's my car keys? Where in Lewy body dementia, they have more hallucinations and delusions earlier on. It's they, faster, isn't it? Also? The progress yeah. is more related to age than it is related to the disease type. For example, for those of you familiar with cancer treatment, the earlier, the younger you are when you have cancer, the more rapid the progression. Same thing is true with Alzheimer's disease. The youngest confirmed case of Alzheimer's is 27 years old, so it's the young. Only gets about two years post-diagnosis. Lewy body, because it is starts earlier in life, tends to be more rapidly progressive. And you said it's on the rise. Is it? Is it is on the rise. rise. It's the second leading cause of all dementias in the United States is Lewy body disease and rising. The baby boomers, the one in three that will be demented in that Lewy body issue, um, is more frontal temporal. So there's more impulse issues, more hallucinations, delusions, judgment issues, you know, sleep, insomnia. Um, but the best one to probably go to is the Alzheimer's Association because they will, what they will have is they'll have a whole bunch of different links and different trials that are going on. And the, how many sites where you can where I can participate online? Is that the one that they said? Yes. Um, I'm actually a member of the Trial Match program, and what they had for me was online like memory tests to get a baseline. So what they had me look at was a deck of cards, and then after they said, have you seen this one before? Um, and so it was online, um, so it's not very invasive, but it was a clinical trial to kind of uh, for healthy individuals. And you, so you said yes, right? I did not scrub <laughs> highly as I thought I would, <laughs> but um, so it's yeah, you can to get a whole pool of participants, particularly in the baby boomers. Absolutely, yeah. So you can um, go on our website, or you can um, call, and they can match you up with clinical trials, and you can tell how invasive. You Less invasive, the better. I just one more quick. Okay. Any other questions? Um, my question is about educating the doctors. Mm. I, I'm new to this industry, so I'm not pretending that I have any answers, but what keeps coming up for me in all my talkings with everybody around is the doctors need to know to start doing some cognitive tests early. So how do you get to those to ivory towers? Money. <laughs> yeah. It's what it boils down to and why so many People with Alzheimer's disease have a dementia diagnosis and not an Alzheimer's diagnosis is because of money. Your HMO is not going to pay for a PET scan, an enzyme test, or the modified MRI. You have to be involved in a research project that's funded by a drug company 
to be able to afford to do the extensive testing that's needed and when they could do it and 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 as the new mental state exam and be eighty percent sure they don't see the cost benefit of doing all the further research that's why it's really important to do the alzheimer's association these trial match programs and get involved i gotta tell you it's a little bit of a scary thing to go be tested first time i took the mini mental state exam i thought oh my gosh am i gonna pass it was harder than i thought what floor am i on i'm in between it's diagnosis is really important it's a matter of funding if you have enough money your doctor will do what you want good question thank you thank you very much